Good evening, everybody. Uh, <clears throat> welcome to the Coastal Plain Oil and, <laughs> Oil and Gas Leasing Program public, in, public meeting. We'll be starting in just a few minutes. We have some people filtering in. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the virtual public meeting on supplemental environmental impact statement for the Coastal Plain Oil and Gas Leasing Program. We're gonna wait just a few more minutes, but we still have some folks coming in. Good evening. Good evening, everybody. I'm Jim Hart. I'll be the facilitator for today's meeting. I want to welcome and thank you for participating in this virtual public meeting on the Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement for the Coastal Plain Oil and Gas Leasing Program. The meeting will consist of a brief presentation, simultaneous with Q&A, and followed by oral testimony for those who registered. The presenter will be Serena Sweet, the BLM Project Manager. The slides are available on the BLM Alaska website for anyone who wants to follow along on their phones. Go to the BLM Alaska website and follow the links to the Coastal Plain SEIS planning page. Uh, some planning logistics, I'm sorry, meeting logistics. This is a virtual meeting presentation. Uh, there are some things I wanna go over before we start. Uh, there is a Q&A box available for you to ask questions throughout the presentation portion of the meeting. How to use it? Well, if you look down on those Zoom controls at the bottom of your screen, or some of you might have it docked at the top, uh, you'll see a Q&A box. Click on that and ask your question. We can't answer any political questions. We may not have an answer immediately, so please be patient. 
Uh, you can also ask questions in writing, which is probably the best option for more complex questions. This meeting is being recorded. What does it mean uh, that the meeting is being recorded? A recording will be used to develop a transcript of everything spoken for our records. The virtual meeting may be put on Facebook, on the project website, or other platforms so people who miss the meetings can view the meeting at a later time at their convenience. This is also a benefit for folks who might have issues with bandwidth related glitches during the live meeting. If you miss anything, you can go back to the recording to listen. Phone in participants can ask questions after the presentation concludes. You will be able to unmute yourself, but please wait until called on. For folks on the phone, press star nine to raise your hand, star six to unmute yourself. And now once again, star nine to raise your hand, star six to unmute yourself. There will be a brief time after the presentation um, dedicated for phoning callers only so that they can ask questions. At the conclusion of the phoning caller questions, we'll no longer take Q&As. This is so we can focus on testimony. After the conclusion of the questions, we will take testimony. Each person gets three minutes. We want to make sure that everybody can testify if they choose. Appropriate language. Anyone who uses inappropriate language will lose their opportunity to testify at this meeting. Disruptive behavior. Anyone who uses this platform to disrupt the meeting will also lose their opportunity to testify. Things like reading poetry or playing music are not testimony and not appropriate for this forum. Priority goes to the first time testifiers and each person has only one opportunity per meeting. And don't forget, if you weren't able to orally testify today, you can also upload your testimony to the BLM NEPA register. Look for the link at the BLM Alaska website. With that, Allow me to introduce Tom Heinlein, the Acting State Director for BLM Alaska. Tom? All right, thank you, Jim. Uh, and welcome, everyone. Uh, again, uh, my name is Tom Heinlein. I'm the Acting State Director for the Bureau of Land Management here in Alaska. So first off, I'd just like to thank you all for joining us um, as we safely engage you through virtual public meetings. It's important to me that we get this information to you in the most efficient and quickest way possible and provide multiple platforms to receive feedback from you. By doing these meetings virtually, we're protecting the health of the communities that we serve and allowing you the ability to get information safely. This process is more efficient. It won't get canceled because of weather. It allows us to schedule more meetings to accommodate your schedule, and it costs the taxpayers less in travel costs and brings in a wider, more diverse audience. It's another tool we intend to continue using in addition to in-person meetings once conditions warrant. So tonight what we're going to do is to discuss the supplemental environmental impact statement for the Coastal Plain Oil and Gas Leasing Program. After conducting a review required by Executive Order 13990 and brought to conclusion with Secretary's Order 3401, the Department of the Interior identified defects in the underlying record of decision supporting the leases, including the lack of analysis of a reasonable range of alternatives in the environmental impact statement conducted under the National Environmental Policy Act. The Bureau of Land Management and the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service are co-leading a comprehensive analysis of potential environmental impacts to address deficiencies identified in Secretary's Order 3401 and to analyze potential additional alternatives. So with that, I'd like to now turn this over to my counterpart, Karen Cogswell, who's the Acting Regional Director for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service here in Alaska. Thanks, Tom. Good evening, everyone. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service appreciates the opportunity to work with the Bureau of Land Management in preparing this supplemental EIS for the Coastal Plain Oil and Gas Leasing Program in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Under the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act, or ANILCA, the service is tasked with managing the Arctic refuge in a manner which one, conserves animals and plants in their natural diversity, two, ensures the opportunity for continued local subsistence use, three, protects water quality and quantity, and four, fulfills international wildlife treaty obligations. The Tax Act added a fifth purpose for Arctic refuge, providing for an oil and gas program. In addition to our responsibilities as a land manager, we have responsibilities under the Endangered Species Act, Marine Mammal Protection Act, Wilderness Act, Migratory Bird Treaty Act, and Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. 
Thank you to those of you who have taken time to join this hearing today. We look forward to hearing your comments that will help guide development of the SEIS. Thank you, Karen. Now it's time to introduce Serena Sweet, the presenter for today. Serena, take it away. Thank you, Jim. I'm Serena Sweet, and I'm the BLM Alaska project manager for this project. I would also like to recognize a group of specialists that are listening in and will also be assisting with these public meetings. These individuals include Tom Heinlein, the BLM Alaska Acting State Director, Kevin Pendergast, the BLM Alaska Deputy State Director for Resources, Shelly Jones, the BLM Alaska Arctic District Office Manager, Bob King, the BLM Alaska Archaeologist, Craig Purim, the BLM Alaska Wildlife Biologist, Rob Brumbaugh, the BLM Alaska Oil and Gas Section Chief, Chris McKee, the BLM Alaska Subsistence Coordinator, Beth Miko, the BLM Alaska Arctic Anthropologist, Leslie Ellis Waters, the BLM Alaska Communications Director, and with Fish and Wildlife Service, we have Karen Cogswell, the Fish and Wildlife Service Acting Regional Director, Wendy Loya, the Fish and Wildlife Service Regional Director for Science, International, and Migratory Birds, Charlie Hamilton, the Fish and Wildlife Service Marine Mammal Specialist, Steve Berenson, the Fish and Wildlife Service Arctic Re Refuge Manager, Josh Rose, the Fish and Wildlife Service Oil and Gas Coordinator for the Arctic Refuge, and finally, Paul Wennard, the Fish and Wildlife Service Arctic Refuge Ecologist. Next, we will view a presentation about the project that has been pre-recorded for consistency. And now we will begin the presentation. Agenda. Today, we're going to cover an overview of the project area, background information, decisions to be made, agency responsibilities, the tentative schedule, and how to participate in the process. I will also be indicating that we are moving to the next slide and reading from all of the slides for everyone that is following along on a hard copy of the presentation. Now on to slide three. Project area map. Project area. The area comprising the coastal plain includes approximately 1.6 million acres within the approximately 19.3 million acre Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service is the predominant land manager in the program area. Other lands in the coastal plain include Alaska Native lands conveyed pursuant to the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act, also known as ANCSA, and Native allotments. The program area excludes a northern coastal portion of Air Force administered lands near Kaktovik. Lands outside the BLM's Oil and Gas Leasing Authority are those excluded from the definition of the coastal plain in Public Law 115-97, Native Conveyed Lands, and other Native Selective Lands. Now slide four. Background. In September of 2019, and in connection with Public Law 115-97, the BLM completed the Coastal Plain Oil and Gas Leasing Final EIS. The BLM then issued a Record of Decision, or ROD, on August 8th of 2020. The Record of Decision approved a program to implement the Tax Act, which directed the BLM to manage the oil and gas leasing program on the Coastal Plain in a manner similar to lease sales under the Naval Petroleum Reserves Production Act of 1976. On June 1st of 2021, the Secretary of the Interior issued Secretary's Order 3401, which directed a temporary halt on all department activities related to the leasing program in the Arctic Refuge pending a new comprehensive analysis of potential environmental impacts of the program to address identified legal deficiencies. On August 4th, 2021, a notice of intent was published in the Federal Register, kicking off the Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement process. Now slide five, decisions to be made. The purpose of this public scoping process is to determine the scope of issues to be addressed and to identify the significant issues, including any legal deficiencies in the final EIS related to an oil and gas leasing program within the coastal plain. Supplemental analysis may include, but is not limited to, revision of reasonably foreseeable development scenarios and areas available for leasing, 
an alternative allowing for less than 2,000 acres of surface development, updated analysis of greenhouse gas emissions, new information related to subsistence resources such as fish, marine mammals, caribou, and other subsistence use and access issues, a wider range of potential development outcomes, and or revision of lease stipulations and required operating procedures. Information received during this process will influence the development of the Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement and guide the scope of the environmental analysis. The BLM will work collaboratively with interested parties to identify the management decisions best suited to local, regional, and national needs and concerns. Slide 6, Agency Responsibilities. The Bureau of Land Management is the lead federal agency for the development of the Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement. The BLM is also responsible for management of the leasing program and conducting lease sales and adjudicating relevant permits. The Fish and Wildlife Service is a partner with BLM in preparation of the Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement and administers surface responsibilities of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Other cooperating agencies are still being determined. Letters have been sent to interested tribes, Alaska Native corporations, and other potential cooperating agencies. Slide 7, Tentative Schedule. This table includes the tentative schedule for the major milestones of the Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement process. Please note these dates are subject to change. As you can see from the colorful graphic, we are in the beginning phases of the overall process. The scoping period we are in now, which is the second orange box on the top graphic, closes on October 4th, 2021. We anticipate that we will have a draft Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement in June 2022 and a final Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement in the summer of 2023. We project that it will take approximately 24 months to complete the analysis process from publication of the Notice of Intent to the Record of Decision in August of 2023. Slide 8. How to Participate Testimony tonight will be recorded to incorporate into the analysis process. You can also provide comments through the NEPA register at www.blm.gov forward slash Alaska to find the link to the project webpage and also by clicking on the Participate Now button. Emails are accepted at blm underscore ak underscore coastal plain underscore supplemental eis at blm.gov or comments can be mailed to BLM, Alaska State Office, Attention Coastal Plain, Supplemental EIS, 222 West 7th Avenue, Number 13, Anchorage, Alaska, 99513. As a reminder, scoping comments will be accepted through October 4th. And slide 9, thank you for being here today, and we look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Serena. All right, next we'll have, uh, we'll begin accepting questions from our callers. Uh, this is not the time for testimony. These are for questions on the presentation. Uh, and this is for listeners on the phone who are not on the Zoom application, not, uh, and we're not able to use the Q&A feature through Zoom. So if you have any questions about the presentation, raise, uh, hit star nine on your phone and then star six to unmute yourself and we'll, we'll call on you uh, by your last four on your phone number. Does anybody on the phone have any questions about the presentation? Okay, we're not seeing any hands raised. So next we'll begin the testimony portion. And for that, I will hand it over to Serena. Thank you, Jim. Uh, the first person we have on our list is Kimberly Wright. Um, after Kimberly, just a he heads up, we have uh, Kit uh, Des Desloriers. I apologize if I'm butchering your name. Um, and after that, we have uh, Artina Haven. If any of you are on, please raise your hand. We will go in that order. Um, so please raise your hand and we will, we will get started. Do we have Kimberly Wright on? 
Hello, Kimberly. Let's see if I can unmute. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes, hello. Okay, great. Hey, thanks for allowing the public to um, participate in this. This is my um, first one for the BLM, and I'm really um, <clears throat> interested in the process of um, how you are deciding to move forward on uh, the project. Um, I'm a biologist in Southern California. Um, I have a wildlife center, and I'm um, really opposed to dedicating more public lands to gas and oil uh, development and drilling. I feel like with climate change and habitat destruction right now and all the species and environment that is really, um, it's taking its toll on um, public lands. And I feel like we as uh, public citizens have a right to have um, our public lands free of development. And I know it's, it's becoming fewer and far between of how much land is left for uh, gas and oil development. And I realize, I think that we should keep what we have um, unscathed for the indigenous people, for the wildlife, and for the participation of Americans to enjoy for future generations. Thank you. Thank you, Kimberly. Uh, next up is Kit. Uh, looks like Kit. Des lawyers. Again, I apologize for the mispronunciation. I'm not seeing Kit on our list. Um, Artnia Haven, are you on? If you could please raise your hand. Hello. All right, if you could unmute yourself, you are ready to go. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, thank you so much for this opportunity. My name is Artina Havan and I live in Southern California. Um, and I oppose uh, drilling for oil and gas uh, and or giving leases to drill for oil and gas in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. This refuge, as you know, you are all professionals um, who are very well versed in this, supports an exceptional array of wildlife and um, these wild, the wildlife is already very vulnerable because of climate change. Um, if oil and gas drilling happens, um, they will lose their habitat. And I don't know how we can rectify that. Uh, we are currently seeing the effects of climate change. Um, in my state of California, there are, um, there are fires that are burning continuously. The intensity of these fires and the quantity has increased. Um, in, on the East Coast, we are seeing that the intensity of hurricanes have increased. So climate change is happening. And the reason it's happening is because of drilling of oil and gas, because um, it's because of carbon dioxide and burning of fossil fuels, which are oil and gas, that we have this issue. So we should not use this pristine beautiful land for drilling oil and gas. We should concentrate on sustainable energies. In addition, um, there are indigenous populations that have lived on this land for centuries and their livelihood depends on uh, the, the biodiversity on this land. And um, uh, drilling has had horrifying effects of spillage and we know that oil and gas companies are not very good at cleaning spillage. In addition, it's very difficult to clean oil and gas in very, very cold water in the Arctic. And also rescue crews are very far away if such a thing were to happen. So this is a dangerous situation if we wanna lease this very pristine and beautiful land. Once again, I vehemently oppose drilling and we should very seriously consider looking at the biodiversity and the indigenous populations that live on this land and we should respect them. Thank you. Thank you very much. All right, up next we have Barbara Baker. Barbara, are you on? 
you could please raise your hand by clicking the button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. I don't see Barbara. All right, after Barbara, we have uh, Claire Gallagher. Are you on? If you could click the raise your hand button, there you are. And you can unmute yourself now. Great, thanks. All good. Hi, my name is Claire Gallagher. I'm a professional runner out of Colorado and work for the clothing brand Patagonia in environmental advocacy. In June of 2019, I, along with professional rock climber Tommy Codwell, runner Luke Nelson, and photographer Austin Zydek went to the Arctic Refuge. We climbed the second highest peak, Mount Hubley, and Packraft through the coastal plain, one of the most wild places left on this planet. It gives me chills, like I'm gonna start crying. It was so, so wild. So think back to the map you saw of the coastal plain at the beginning of this presentation, and we traveled down the entire length of the Jago River, one of those major thoroughfares. This is a place with thousands of caribou and hundreds of which were newborn calves eating as much plant life as they could before making their great migration back over the brook rains to their winter grounds. We saw wolf, grizzlies, hundreds of migratory bird species. And we walked over giant cracks in the tundra, huge 50 foot crevasses in the land due to melting perma permafrost. So we could see the ice melting before our feet, proof that climate change, humans burning of fossil fuels was already, is already changing this place irrevocably. And yet this is where some folks want to extract more fossil fuels to burn and worsen climate change. So for the record, we went through draft lease sales tracks 2, 4, 11, and 18. These are very full of wildlife still. I studied ecology at Princeton University, and if I learned one thing, it's that we must fully protect our most wild ecosystems while we still can. And that is what I urge the experts in the BLM to do here. Most importantly, this is a human rights issue. Our group also met with and learned from Gwich'in hunters and community leaders, youth and elders, all of whom know the Arctic Refuge as the sacred place where life begins. It's their sacred land. They have unanimously and consistently asked for their sacred ancestral lands to be protected, not just because they're sacred, but also because their livelihoods depend on a stable climate and ecosystem stable migratory routes of moose, birds, fish, and caribou in their northern Alaskan region um, due to uh, needing these stable migratory routes um, for food, basic food needs. So drilling would impact this. We know this. It would impact Gwich'in livelihoods. I, as an American citizen, like Gwich'in, ask that the Gwich'in people are listened to here and that the Arctic Refuge is permanently protected from any extraction, exploration, and drilling in perpetuity. Thank you so much for making this hearing possible. Um, I really appreciate it, unlike the last round, so many thanks. Thank you, uh, Claire. All right, uh, let's see. The next individual we have on our list is Deanna Noel. Is Deanna on? Um, how about Chet Colton? If you could raise your hand by clicking the button at the bottom of the screen, please, if you are on. All right, I'm not seeing Chet. Uh, the next individual would be uh, Colleen Cartwright. Colleen, are you on? Not seeing Colleen. Uh, let's see, Vivian Napier, are you on? If you could click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen, please. Hi, Vivian. And you can unmute yourself now. It looks like you're still muted, Vivian. Okay, got it now. There you are. And okay. if you could, if you could actually uh, say and spell your full name, uh, that would be great. Thank you. Okay, my name is Vivian Napier. Last name is N-A-P-I-E-R, and I am a um, 
individual that has lived in the United States all of my life. I currently live in the state of Florida, which about as far as you can get from Alaska. And I just wanted to express that I was dismayed that they're looking to expand exploration into the uh, refuge in Alaska again. And I vehemently oppose this. There's enough problems that we've got with climate change now. And I think exploring for more gas and oil and damaging the environment in Alaska, which is one of our most precious resources that we have in the world. And I'm hoping that the money that they want to spend for gas and oil can glow, go for other purposes that would stop climate change from happening uh, and uh, getting worse than it already is. Florida right now is experiencing tremendous hurricane, rain, flooding, and other environmentals. We have manatees, which is one of our beloved sea cows that is dying because of environmental problems and climate change that has been happening. And we're having a hard time finding a way to correct the situation. But I would just like to say that I don't, I don't believe that, that Congress or anyone else should be allowed to go in and influence the environment any more than it's already been influenced by leasing land. And there was another comment made that I'm hoping that the, um, that somehow the refugees, refugee can be um, permanently banned from having any future land lease uh, opposed, you know, going into there and making any changes. It should become a permanent source for the world to enjoy and give the people that are the residents of Alaska what's left of it to live out the rest of their lives. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Thank you, Vivian. All right, uh, next on the list, uh, we have Janet Hirschberger. Janet, are you on? If you could raise your hand by clicking the button at the bottom of the screen, uh, the raise hand button. Not seeing Janet. Uh, after Janet would be uh, Dana Chapman. I hope that's correct. Hi. All right, Dana, you're up. You can unmute yourself. Hi, um, my name is Diani Chapman. I live in Anchorage, Alaska. Um, and I adamantly oppose all drilling in the Arctic for a few reasons. Um, first being, I read the IPCC report that came out several weeks ago, and we have to move away from burning fossil fuels as quickly as we possibly can, and drilling in the Arctic is counter to that. We're already experiencing the effects of a warming planet. Wildfires have raged across the lower 48 this past summer and the summer before set records as well. There are 20 fires or wildfires that are burning in Alaska right now. More extreme storms are hitting coasts and causing devastating damage. Our glaciers here in Alaska are retreating at approximately 115 feet per year. Permafrost is melting. Land is quickly going to become unsuitable for agriculture. And every barrel of oil that we extract and burn makes all of those problems worse. The next thing is there is wildlife in the refuge and drilling is bad for them. It could disrupt the migratory route of the porcupine caribou. Drilling would also damage the habitat of wolves, musk oxen, arctic foxes, wolverines, polar bears, all sorts of birds. Bottom line, when we drill, we spill. And these species all have enough to contend with due to climate change and other environmental problems without desecrating their home. Um, and finally, the Gwich'in people have clearly stated their opposition to drilling in the Arctic refuge, and we should listen. Sometime between tonight and two weeks from now, I'll become an auntie for the first time. 
And that baby and all of our children and grandchildren should have a word, world that can feed them, give them water, and has beautiful places full of a whole range of species. If we drill in the Arctic refuge, we're actively lowering the likelihood of that future. So we should not drill in the refuge. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you very much. All right, uh, next up we have Julie Beer. Are you on, Julie? If you could please raise your hand by clicking the button at the bottom of the screen. Hello, Julie. Um, and if you could please uh, say and spell your name uh, when you get started, that would be fantastic. Thank you. And you can unmute yourself. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great. My name is Julie Beer. That's B-E-E-R, like the drink. I live in um, the San Francisco Bay Area in Palo Alto. I used to live in Kodiak, Alaska when I was young. Wonderful experience. I've been to Alaska several times and just love the wildness of it. I haven't been lucky enough to go to the um, Alaska National Wildlife Refuge, but I have seen quite a few videos about it. It's beautiful. The porcupine caribou herd is wonderful. Many species of birds that nest there. It's just, it's wonderful. If, if you know, if you, if you drill there, the, the damage is going to be, is going to be permanent. It's, it's a very fragile ecosystem. I got my degree in biology. I agree with the others before that we just shouldn't be drilling for oil there. It's, um, we don't need it. And climate change is real. I live in California. I, now we're afraid. Everybody I know is afraid of summer now. We can't even, I don't even think of hiking anymore. Maybe in May before the fires start. Now we just consider it fire season. Last year we had Big Basin National Park almost completely destroyed with um, a bunch of uh, redwoods that were over, you know, 1,000, 2,000 years old. It's terrible. Right now there's a fire in um, Sequoia uh, and a lot of the old sequoias are burning. Uh, we have enough oil. We should not be burning any more fossil fuels. And so I just really, really am opposed to this um, oil and gas development. And I appreciate being able to give my opinion. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, uh, next up we have uh, Judith Beaver. Judith, if you could please raise your hand um, by clicking the button at the bottom of your screen. Are you on Judith? Not seeing Judith on. Um, all right, after Judith, um, let's see, the next individual would be uh, Drew Martin. Do we have Drew Martin on tonight? If you could raise your hand by clicking the button at the bottom of the screen, please, to raise your hand. Uh, Christine Kuntz, you're up next after Drew. Are you on, Christine? And I see a hand raised with the phone number. Um, we will go ahead and turn you on. Um, please, um, let me see, it's uh, star, star six to unmute yourself on the phone. If you please push star six. It looks like you're unmuted. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, hello. Can you please- Yes, yeah, so uh, this is Drew. Oh, sorry. Yep, go ahead and say and spell your uh, full name, please. Drew Martin, D-R-E-W, last name M-A-R-T-I-N. Uh, I oppose uh, drilling in the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. I believe that uh, we need to be uh, moving away from fossil fuel use. Any drilling would not bring oil and gas online anytime soon. However, the environmental impacts would be devastating to the wildlife who live there. I'm particularly concerned about the porcupine caribou, which the indigenous people, the Gwich'in, rely upon for their survival. 
I think that preserving nature is more important to the long-term health of the United States and benefits that we need to focus our resources on finding alternative sources of energy. I'm very concerned about the damage it would also do to the polar bear population, which is in that area, as well as sea life as any type of oil spill can be very damaging. It's very hard to clean up. I was a member of the Coast Guard Reserve when the oil spill with the Exxon Valdez and a number of uh, members of my unit went up there to work on it and do the cleanup. And I know that it was extremely difficult to actually clean the oil up, that in the long run, the cleanup was never paid for. So I ask you not to move forward with these leases and any oil and gas drilling in the Arctic Wildlife Refuge. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, I still don't see Christine uh, Kuntz on. If you're on, Christine, if you could please push the button at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you're on the phone, uh, please push star six to raise your hand, or excuse me, star nine to raise your hand and star six to un unmute yourself. All right, uh, next on the list would, is uh, Jeffrey Bari. Are you on, Jeffrey? If you could please raise your hand, push the button. There you are. And you are now able to unmute yourself. Hey, thank you so much for this opportunity um, to uh, register a comment. My name is Jeffrey Berry, and I am currently CEO of Tennessee Environmental Council, and uh, which in the past has been part of the Alaska Coalition of Tennessee. And there's a lot of support in Tennessee for preserving the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge, not just uh, preventing oil drilling, but also establishing a permanent wilderness there. And, then, and so I am in favor of that direction. But I think uh, my comment, I'd like to focus on the process um, and make some recommendations. I've been to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. I produced a documentary film in the late 1990s called Arctic Quest that was um, broadcast on public television. Uh, to the ire of Arctic Power and some of the pro-drilling lobbyists, but I interviewed oil industry um, experts in Prudhoe Bay, as well as the Gwich'in people in Old Crow that depend upon the caribou for their survival. I also interviewed Native Alaskans um, and uh, went to the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge Coastal Plain to see it for myself, and I went there with a group of high school students, uh, so that was all documented. Um, but there's a, an incredible book uh, that has come out by Finus Dunaway this past spring, and it's called Defending the Arctic Refuge. And the book documents several scientific um, studies that have been done by um, the U.S. federal government over the years that have showed irreparable damage that would be done to the wildlife, the species, and the landscape, and the indigenous uh, subsistence um, aspects as well if oil drilling were to take place. And I um, and a lot of those studies were not fully revealed to Congress, and a lot of the important information was um, um, struck out of those final reports to Congress. And so I just want to make sure that we have a really transparent process where the um, science is revealed to the American public, as well as to Congress, so that we can make a decision based on science, um, not on uh, only parts of the science. We want to see the whole picture of the true impacts of what oil drilling would happen in the Arctic Refuge. And I, my understanding is that's not what um, took place under the Trump administration. And that's why we have this process now, which I really appreciate it. Um, and also I would um, hope that we, that the process would allow for the Gwich'in people to be interviewed at, in their villages and to understand, make sure their perspectives about um, the importance of this area um, as a subsistence, uh, the, the foundation of their subsistence way of life and their culture. And we all know uh, after 9-11 what it feels like to be threatened, for our culture to be threatened. Um, and that's exactly the feeling that the Gwich'in have faced for decades, knowing that there might be oil drilling in the Arctic Refuge. So their voices must be heard. This is an, an issue of environmental justice, and we have to respect the Gwich'in way of life as well. Uh, so thank you for the time, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. 
All right. Uh, next on the list, we have uh, uh, Princess Lukai. Are you on, Princess? Um, if you're on the phone, you can push star nine to raise your hand. All right. And Pam Miller, are you on? If you could press the button at the bottom of the screen to raise your hand or star nine. I'm not seeing Pam on. All right, well, that includes all of the individuals that were pre-registered to provide uh, testimony tonight. So at this time, um, we can move to any individuals who are on that maybe did not select uh, to provide testimony previously and would like to this evening. If you could please raise your hand, um, either by pushing the button at the bottom of your screen or pushing star nine if you're on the phone. And we have, uh, let's see, Jim, uh, Steets, I'm going to say. If you could please uh, say and spell your full name um, before you get started, that would be great. Uh, Jim, it, you're good to go. Thank you. Yes, Jim Steitz. That's S-T-E-I-T-Z. And um, I'll keep my com comments very brief, mostly, mostly otherwise redundant. Um, I think it's appropriate um, Sadly, ironic, perhaps, that the BOM is uh, having to undergo this process, uh, this supplemental EIS process, amid America's summer of, of climate suffering. Um, it seems to be, you know, one lesson from our atmosphere after another that uh, this exact sort of activity just cannot go on much longer. And I think that all, all reasonable people, all people of intellectual integrity, um, now have accepted and understands the consequences of continuing to burn fossil fuels. And in fact, we can put some pretty hard numbers on the consequences of specific decisions. I would point the BLM to the study that was just published in the journal Nature uh, just a week ago, in fact, indicating that if we have, are to have even a decent chance of keeping climate change within 1.5 degrees Celsius, most of the world's fossil fuels must remain underground, and that includes 60% of the known oil in the world. And if we make the reasonable assumption that uh, the other 40% that could plausibly be extracted uh, without committing suicide would be the lowest priced uh, or easiest to extract oil, cheapest to extract, uh, that certainly does not include the North Slope of Alaska. So there's literally no mathematical way to squeeze this leasing program into the remaining carbon budget of a world uh, that can support human civilization as we recognize it. Um, I understand the difficult position that BLM is in, um, having been ordered by statute to conduct leasing. However, uh, it seems to me that BLM is in the position of having to choose which law to obey at this point. Um, I don't think you can conduct this leasing without violating the Endangered Species Act and other wildlife protection laws, those pertaining to migratory birds in particular. And uh, I will note that the revenue estimates that were explicitly used to authorize this leasing program have turned out to be a complete farce. They're off by orders of magnitude. So if you were going to choose which laws to honor, um, it seems to me that the Tax Act would not be it. It would be more appropriate to set that aside in recognition of the fact that you cannot obey it without making a mockery of the, B of the BLM's other obligations, both moral and legal. If the Alaska Oil and Gas Association wants to sue, go ahead and let them. If the bids received on the BLM's first uh, auction of oil leases are any, are any indication, uh, the revenue or dollar amounts involved would be fairly small. And that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thank you, Jim. All right, we have an individual with their hand raised uh, with the phone number, last four digits, uh, 2409. Uh, 2409, if you could please uh, unmute yourself by pushing star six and say and spell your full name before starting your comment, please. 
Okay, my name is Robert Thompson. I live in Coffeyville, Alaska. It's within the borders of the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. My concerns about this aren't abstract. I live here and I'm seeing climate change. Uh, we have no more muskox. They're gone. There used to be a lot of them, but because of climate change, they are not here anymore. The polar bear are, uh, the models show that they'll be extinct probably by 2050. And that's all related to climate change, burning the fossil fuel. So since I live here, I'm concerned about our health. I don't see that there's any, there's been any baseline study for the health of the people of the North Slope that are affected by this uh, emissions related to the extraction, the extraction process, and also the projected pollution that generated the, the pro oil people that want the refuge to put it as high as 16 billion barrels in the refuge. Well, what's going to happen to our atmosphere if they get their way and extract the people consume 16 billion barrels out of this refuge? It's uh, Stephen Hawkins predicted by. 2600, this planet will not be habitable because of climate change. We've had five degrees change here in the Arctic already. Uh, there's numerous signs of things that are happening around. We've got new species that have moved in. Uh, it's just everywhere we've had caribou die right in this island because of uh, ingesting ice. It rains in the winter. We get heavy fog in the winter because of open water. Uh, the Polar bear will probably be gone because there's so much open water and that's their habitat. When I came here in the early 70s, the pack ice was visible from the shore. Now it's been up to 700 miles open water. Now, it, that generally is climate, three climate change. It's deterred happening in White Horse Canada in 1999. So we've been aware of it for quite a while and uh, it's time we got to do something. If we don't, it has very serious consequences, not for just us. It, it will have consequences for our wildlife, but for the whole world. Uh, another thing that's deficient in this uh, proposed activity is the baseline study that was done in 87. It's you have about Things 30 have seconds, Robert. Then. We had muskox. Are you there, Robert? All right, if we get Robert back, we can uh, give him his last 30 seconds. All right, um, do we have anyone else who is interested in providing testimony tonight? Please uh, raise your hand by clicking the button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, Ron, please uh, say and spell your full, full name before providing your testimony. Uh, you should be able to unmute yourself now. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. My name is Ron Feich. It's R-O-N. Last name is F-A-I-C-H. I'm calling from Albuquerque, New Mexico, pretty far away and certainly not a, an Alaskan environment, semi-arid environment. In fact, we're in drought, another consequence of climate change. I've just been struck by the unanimity of all of the comments here tonight opposing the leasing and allowing for the oil and gas drilling. It does seem to me that oil and gas are the way of the last century and a half. And we have to look to the future and that is not going to be oil and gas or we're going to all suffer even more worse consequences than we already are seeing. And so I just wanna endorse everybody's comments here. It's been very knowledgeable, very impressive. I've learned a lot and I appreciate it. I 100% am opposed to oil and gas drilling 
in the Alaska National Wildlife Refuge. Thanks for this opportunity. Thank you, Ron. Again, if you're interested in providing testimony tonight, we still have lots of time available. If you could please click the raised hand button at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you're on the phone, please click uh, press star nine <laughs> uh, to raise your hand. Again, we have plenty of time if there's anyone interested in providing testimony tonight. Um, again, just click that raise hand button at the bottom of your screen, or you can push star nine to raise your hand if you're on the phone. Not seeing any hands raised, so we will go ahead and wait for a few minutes. Um, if you feel like you would like to provide testimony, you have plenty of time, feel, feel free to sit tight and uh, get your thoughts together and raise your hand when you're ready. We'll be on for a little while yet. Just a reminder for anyone who maybe came on recently, um, if you're interested in providing testimony tonight, if you could please uh, click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen or push star nine on your phone uh, to raise your hand and we can provide time for that testimony. We have plenty of time this evening.
Hello, for those of you who maybe joined recently, uh, we're still taking testimony. Um, if you're interested in providing testimony, please press the uh, raise hand button at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Uh, if you would are on the phone and would like to provide testimony, please push star nine to raise your hand and we will get you unmuted. Again, that's star nine if you are on the phone um, and the raise hand button within the Zoom screen if you are on your computer. I do see a question that popped in about providing uh, an opportunity. Will there be an opportunity to provide testimony at the end of the second session tomorrow as well? Um, there will be so long as we have time once we have gotten through all of the pre-registered individuals who request to provide testimony. Uh, so we will prioritize those individuals who pre-register uh, first. And if there is additional time set up in the meeting, then we will provide op an open forum as we are right now. Again, that's star nine to raise your hand if you're on the phone or the raise hand button which in, within the Zoom platform if you're interested in providing testimony now. And we have just over about 10 minutes here. Uh, we will wait and see if anyone is interested in providing testimony. Check back in in a minute. Just another reminder, if you're interested in providing testimony and have recently joined on, please uh, click the raise your hand button, raise hand uh, on the Zoom screen, or you can push star nine if you're on the phone to raise your hand and we'll get you unmuted. Um, we had a quick question come in regarding the written testimony included in the record tonight. Um, the, the full testimony tonight will be transcribed and included in the record to answer that question. All right, we'll check back here in a minute. And we do have one hand raised, Ron. Um, we will open up your mic. I just have another question. You mentioned a second session tomorrow. Is that just the duplication of this session or is it new material? Um, it is the same meeting we are holding this evening. Uh, it will be um, basically the same session. We have six sessions total, including tonight's session. Um, there was one this morning, uh, there will be one tomorrow afternoon and one tomorrow evening. Okay. And I don't remember actually how I learned of this session, 
but how do I get on for tomorrow's session? Um, we can provide a link in the chat box um, that will get you to where those sessions can be found. And actually, it looks like there's a link already in there um, that will get you to the homepage for the project. If you click on that link, there are links in there to register for the sessions tomorrow. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Again, if you're interested in providing testimony tonight, if you could please push the raise hand button in your Zoom screen or the star nine button on your phone if you're on via the phone. We have approximately 10 minutes left if anyone wants to provide some last minute uh, testimony before we close out the meeting. We have lots of time left still. I'll check back in here in a minute. And it looks like we have a caller on the phone who has raised their hand. Uh, we will turn on your mic. Please be sure you uh, say and spell your full name. And it is star six to unmute yourself. And you should Hi. be live. Hi, it's Christine Hemphill. C-H-R-I-S-T-I-N-E-H-E-M-P-H-I-L-L. Hemphill. And um, I just would like to have no oil drilling in the National Wildlife Refuge, actually any wildlife and marine refuges, I think should be um, for the animals and for the environment and not have any drilling of any sort or other um, excavation or testing or any kind of activities that um, aren't just conservation and protection of the environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christine. We still have about seven minutes left here. Um, if you're interested in providing testimony, please do click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen or star nine to raise your hand if you're on the phone. All right, we have an individual here. Uh, Lois Norgard, you are uh, able to unmute yourself. If you could please say and spell your full name before you get started, that would be great. Thank you. Yeah, hi, it's Lois, L-O-I-S, and Norgard, N-O-R-R-G-A-R-D. And thank you so much for having this public process and opening up the EIS for a supplemental review. I really appreciate that the BLM is doing that. Um, I am calling, uh, calling in from Bloomington, Minnesota. So I'm in Minnesota. I'm along the Mississippi River here, so definitely connected to the Arctic Refuge through all the birds that we see up and down the Mississippi River Flyway. So it's really, it's an important um, place for Minnesotans too. And I just wanna say that um, we, we really were 
hoping and promised that a place as iconic as the crown jewel of our National Wildlife Refuge system would have a very robust scientifically sound review process before any kind of extractive activity would happen up there. And full public comment, full tribal consultation, the last administration, the Trump administration, just rushed headlong into a leasing program for this area at the expense of science and a sound process. So I'm very, very appreciative that this has been opened up again and that we can have a more comprehensive review of some of the important aspects that people have been mentioning here tonight. I really do want to endorse all the comments you've been hearing so far. So a lot of what I would have said has been said, but I just wanna say a couple extra pieces um, and just kind of support what's been said already. The flawed, EIS is certainly needs a supplement and I'm I just want to add to that that drilling in the refuge would really be bad for both the wildlife and the people who call this place home. Um, the Gwich'in Nation we've heard about here, they have set up their homes along the migratory route of the porcupine caribou herd. They depend on this herd for their subsistence and it's part of their culture for thousands of years. So I'm really glad that the Re, really a robust study of the porcupine caribou and their migration route is going to be part of this next review. I also wanna say um, again that the impacts of climate change were missing in the initial EIS, absolutely missing. So just paying close attention to that and I just wanna be sure to say that the newest report that the IPCC has put out should really be a part of this new supplement. So please do make sure that that new information is part of the comprehensive review that you do for the supplemental EIS and consider all of the impacts that are happening in Alaska due to climate change. So I just wanna add those couple things and I sure do appreciate the chance to have a comment here this evening. And I'm glad you guys have opened up these sessions so that people can have their voices heard. And thank you so much. Thank you, Lois. All right, uh, we've got approximately three minutes left, which is enough time for one more testimony if anyone is interested. If you could please uh, click the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen or star nine on your phone if you're listening by phone uh, to raise your hand. Again, that's star nine on your phone and the raise hand button in your screen if you're interested. We've got just a few minutes left here. All right, one last call. If you're interested in providing testimony, please push the raise hand button at the bottom of your screen or star nine on your phone to raise your hand. Well, seeing no final takers, I do wanna thank you all for participating in this virtual public meeting on the Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement for the Coastal Plain Oil and Gas Leasing Program. Our next scheduled meeting is tomorrow afternoon at one o'clock. Have a great night.